Yes, it's a Monday night here on the compound. So excited for tonight's show. Introduce my co host, Ben Carlson. Hey, everyone. All right. And our special guest here tonight, we have an interview with George Kurtz, who is the founder and CEO of CrowdStrike, which is a publicly traded company on NASDAQ. Ticker symbol is CRWD. George, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for doing this. I know how busy you are. Uh, it's great to be here. I certainly enjoy doing it. Awesome. So, so excited to talk to you about all these topics tonight. Um, just a quick item of housekeeping, and then we'll get into it. I am personally a long-term shareholder in the company. Nothing that you hear from us tonight should be construed as financial advice or a recommendation to buy or sell any security for a full list of terms and conditions. You can see the link below. And the same applies for George and all the regular safe harbor uh, protections that govern these types of public communiques. Uh, I'm sorry, George, we have to do that stuff in, in the securities industry. Yeah. Uh, let's you start with too. this. Yeah. So first, uh, congrats on all your success so far. You are a $50 billion market cap company. The IPO was priced at $34 in June of 2019. So in about three years, shareholders are up 535%. Even if they bought the closing price that first day of trading, they'd be up 270 something percent versus the S&P 500's total return of about 60%. So I know there's a lot of work still to be done, but do you feel some of the pressure come off now that you're into year three, you know how much value has already been created for shareholders in a fairly short period of time? Like what's your, what's your mindset as, as the CEO of uh, a company that's reached this level? Well, we're certainly happy with our performance, but there's always more to do. Uh, All right, good. I didn't want I didn't want you to say we're good. All no, right, good. no, we're we're not. Okay. We're, we're we're always we we're here to win. That's why okay. we uh, that's why we get up every day, and that's really important. So you know, great IPO, great uh, performance over the last eleven quarters, and I think it really um, uh, it really helped reinforces uh, what I tried to build. Uh, in late 2011, along with many other crowd strikers, not just me. And you can see the results. And security is so important in today's day and age. It's uh, it's like air and water and shelter, right? It has to have for it's a must have for any corporation. And uh, we're filling a big need and most importantly, delivering a lot of value for our customers. I think you made a really important statement that I just want to spend a second on. Uh, everybody talks about what's the next big secular growth story whether it's AI or machine learning or it's crypto or what or fintech, you really can't do anything though without the right security. Like anything you would try to build or anything you would try to innovate or create, um, without security, you're 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 building a sandcastle. Um, I'm sure that's apparent to people in high tech, but can you make that point um, a little bit more? Uh, from, from the from the inside from my audience who are investing in all sorts of software companies sure and it's a good question i get asked it all the time like the state of security and how it's evolved and i think the easiest way to explain it is security parallels the slope of the technology curve so if we think about the early days of the web you'd go to a website you'd browse to it and you'd get some information that was that and over time that's evolved to a much more interactive uh you know view of what's happening and you're interacting with data you've got these platforms you got e-commerce i mean you know over 30 years you can see how it's evolved and as the technologies matured there is uh, a security curve that had to follow it so uh you know there's a few things that you needed to do in the in the old days of a firewall on a website and it's much more complicated today with um you know cloud with kubernetes with containers with all these various elaborate um, and really, uh, you know, effective technologies, they need to be secured. So if we believe that security is going to get going to continue to get more complex, uh, I should say, if we believe technology is going to get more complex, then security has to follow along with it. George, a number of years ago, Josh and I were at a, at a conference that we we're putting on and Vanguard CEO, Tim Buckley was giving a speech and someone asked him, what's your biggest risk that no one talks about? And he said, he walks into this room every day and there's a map of the United States and he just sees pings of light every once in a while, and it's all people trying to hack their systems. Yeah. Obviously, for financial institutions, that's a huge thing. Where are these threats coming from? Like, I don't. I mean, I you, people picture on movies hackers sitting in a basement of their mom's house or something. But like, how sophisticated are these people going after this stuff? And, and who are they? Uh, well, it's funny because we call in the security industry we call those pew pew maps, where you know people are shooting, and it looks good for the for the board members. 
but behind the scenes, there's a lot of men and women uh, trying to secure those systems. And uh, there's a lot of adversaries trying to get into them. So if we break down the threat landscape into three areas, just to make it simple, it starts with nation state, the most sophisticated of the adversaries that are out there, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, et cetera. Right. And they have different capabilities. And you move into e-crime. And e-crime is, you know, they say a trillion dollar type industry. And we've seen things like ransomware and business email compromises, all the wire transfer, all that gets wrapped up into those uh, kind of groups. And then the third one, which had tailed off a little bit, but as you might imagine, in today's environment, geopolitical environment is hacktivism. And that is trying to get into a system, making a statement, et cetera. So what we've tried to do at CrowdStrike over the years is, is really identify the adversaries. Sure, we, we build a great platform. We can go through that later. But part of what I think has made us successful is taking an adversary centric view of who's actually trying to get into the system. You know, is it North Korea? Is it Russia? Is it China? Who is it? How do you how do you look at their techniques? How do you defend against it? And when you do that for the board of directors, you really put in the context, why are they trying to, to attack you? You know, we spend time actually looking at the China five year plan. We know where they're deficient in certain areas. Right. And we know that's where they're going to attack to try to steal that intellectual property. And when you can put that in business terms, it makes a real impact to boards of directors. That's a, that's a really good point. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the geopolitical uh, and hacktivism landscape in a moment. I want to get into some of the numbers just to give people a sense of uh, the scale of your business at this point and uh, where it seems to be headed. So you reported Q4. Total revenue was uh, $431 million, which puts you – at about $1.45 in total revenue for the year, uh -huh. 2021, which is about 66% growth. Annual recurring revenue, which is the number that Wall Street is most fixated on, up 65%. So you are a very recurring uh, revenue sort of business, which is what we like these days. Uh -huh. Gross margins, 76% in Q4, which I think would make pretty much any company uh, on Wall Street pretty jealous. Um, and Stock price-wise, I know this isn't terribly important for you, but in the month of March, NASDAQ's up about 3%. CrowdStrike was up 16.5%. You guys have had a lot of news flow and a lot of momentum, and you've been singling out individual uh, customers as part of the reason for that success. So I wanted to ask you about the first one, which you mentioned on the conference call, uh, Amazon AWS Public Cloud Service as a big growth driver for the company. What are you guys doing with Amazon and why should investors be aware of that? Well, we're doing a lot with, with Amazon. Uh, first and foremost, they're a customer, they're, they're a public reference for us, which is fantastic when you, you, know, when you think about the size and scale of, of Amazon. Um, second, they're a great partner to us. The, the Amazon marketplace has been a tremendous growth area for us. And we're one of the leading companies in the AWS marketplace. And that's where customers can go. They can basically pick technologies like ours. They can spin up an instance and have CrowdStrike uh, in their instance, uh, as well as they can actually procure CrowdStrike for their on-premise workstations and, and servers, which is, which is really another good opportunity. And the interesting thing about AWS, I mean, it's a fascinating company, a lot of respect for them. They've created something called the, the uh, enterprise contract that basically you know, a vendor and a customer agree on the contract language and you kind of click away and it takes the six months of negotiating a large contract out of the picture. And we literally have done massive seven figure deals in the span of 45 minutes. People tried the technology, they liked it, but to get the deal done, it took all of 45 minutes. So when you look at how friction free they can make it, we're excited about uh, that channel. Um, we talked about the growth. We talked about the numbers over 100 million. And, uh, you know, we continue to focus on the success with them. So your business on that platform has doubled year over year. And I guess selling directly to enterprise level customers on AWS probably saves not all of the money, but a lot of money that would have in a prior generation gone to um, people in the middle, uh, outside contractors, inside salespeople. Um, does that in part explain why the margins are as healthy as they are? Well, uh, it, it's a little less of that because when you look at that ecosystem, there, there are some economies of scale there, but you know, we have salespeople, we have, have channel partners, we have AWS. You have, to, you have to keep all those partners and constituents happy. So they may get a little less, but they're, they're still getting 
uh, rewarded for the efforts they're putting in. When you look at why the margins are so high, we can dive into that. And that is really the scalability of the model that we built. And the, the key thing about CrowdStrike is when I started it, you know, I looked around and I, I saw a Salesforce and I saw a Workday and I saw a service now, but there was literally nothing. There was no platform security company. It didn't exist. And I thought there should be one. So I created CrowdStrike. Uh, were, you at, uh, Mac, were you at McAfee or, or Norton at that time? Yeah. What? No, I was, at, I was at McAfee. I had a company okay. called Foundstone in the vulnerability management space, and I sold it to them right. and then spent seven years at McAfee. So you saw the and industry me, as, as it was and then said, what's missing here? A hundred percent. I mean, the way the story goes, how I got the company started, we'll get back to the, the margins here in a minute, is I sold a company called Foundstone to McAfee in 2004, spent seven years at McAfee. I was a GM, ran a couple of different you know, uh, business units for him. And I was asked to take the CTO role, which I didn't want. I turned it down twice. And the third time I took it, they, they said, hey, just take it. We're probably going to sell the company and help us out. Ultimately, we sold it to, to Intel. But when I was sort of looking over the entire portfolio, everything to me looked like Siebel. And I thought it should look more like Salesforce. And there were two big uh, epiphanies there. One, people are spending money on security. Guess what? They should get the outcome they deserve, which is not to be breached. But the entire industry was focused on stopping malware instead of stopping breaches. And I just thought about it a little bit differently and said, why not build a platform that actually can work from the cloud that's focused on stopping breaches with a much more modern architecture? Now, that leads to just to answer your question on the margin is because the architecture is a collect once from the agent that runs on these workloads and endpoints. Once we have the data collected and we've already paid for that, every module we add is almost pure gross margin. And that's where you get the scalability in the model. And that's, that, that's where you see the margin improvements. George, I saw the news the other day that you signed a deal with the United States Department of Defense. Talk about this from the perspective of national security. And does that change at all the way that you view this or is it kind of the same process? Well, sure. And to clarify, um, last quarter we announced the deal, or two quarters ago, with CISA, which is one of the kind of departments uh, in the government that's focused on cybersecurity. And what we talked about just a week ago was the fact that we we got another level of certification to be able to sell into the government. And there's different security levels: IL three, four, five, six. Um, those are just impact levels, meaning. The, the, the more controls you have, the greater the population in the U.S. government you can sell to. So we were IL-3. We got IL-4, which opens up the DOD, and then we're in process for IL-5. So it's a big opportunity for us. What does IL-5 get you, Hunter Biden's laptop? Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll leave the color of, like political commentary to others. Okay. But, uh, you know, I'm at the kidding. end of the day, we're focused on helping the government, not only the U.S. government protect themselves, but other governments around the world. So what does IL-4 allow you to do um, in terms of working with the government? It, it obviously, it sounds like a higher level of clearance and it sounds like your uh, products would be more instrumental in protecting us, like in protecting America. Yeah, so uh, today where we operate is in, in civilian agencies. So that's not the DOD and, and, and that's um, IL-3. IL-4 starts to open up more of the DOD uh, to CrowdStrike. Okay. And this is something that obviously very strategically makes sense from a business standpoint, aside from the revenue that would come from the government. I would assume when Fortune 500 companies or organizations around the world are vetting you to do work with them, they probably look at that as like a, a good housekeeping seal of approval to some extent, right? Well, they certainly do. And when you look at the, the CISA win that we had, um, it takes a long time to, to get a win in the government. Um, yeah. I like to say our win there was uh, an overnight 10 year success. You know, it takes a while. They have to sure they have to get with the program in terms of want to use cloud. You need a gov cloud, things of that nature. And uh, we competed against everyone else in the industry and won that. We have a few agencies, but there's over 100 agencies that we can sell to. And it really is the beginning, I think, of a long opportunity uh, in the U.S. government. I wanted to ask you about another recent news item that that caught my eye. And I think the, the market's attention uh, you guys signed a strategic agreement with Mandiant, which um, most people that say where I've heard that name before, there was a bidding war between, I think, Microsoft and Google uh, to acquire Mandiant and mm. Google One uh, or Alphabet One. But uh, Mandiant sounds to me, maybe you could explain this better, like, almost like a SWAT team that comes in after a breach, assesses the situation, 
And then maybe this is a great funnel for you guys to come in and say, okay, um, Mandy and hands it off to CrowdStrike and we make it, we make it so that this never happens again. Do I sort of have that relationship right? Is that how it's going to work? Yeah, it's close to that. So let me explain okay. a little bit. There's a little, little bit more history there. So Kevin Mandy has started at Mandy, and he actually uh, worked uh, at Foundstone in my first company. And that was the early days of the forensic and incident response market. He went off, was super successful, sold the company to FireEye, and ultimately took it over. When FireEye uh, disposed or, or you know, sold off some of their, their endpoint assets to, to McAfee, it became a great opportunity to work with Mandiant. Uh, Mandiant then gets acquired with, by Google. By the way, Google was a big investor in CrowdStrike, so we have a great relationship there. Uh, and we work with the Google Cloud team. So now when we look at the opportunity with Mandiant, and we do this with other incident response providers, is they come in, uh, it, you know, they do a lot of the work, we do a lot of the work as well in these big breaches. And what we find is that when you roll out our technology to actually assess what happened, it stays. And it stays because it gives you visibility of what happened, but also it gives you prevention going forward. And just to give you a stat that we give out internally, when we do these sort of response engagements, for every dollar of service work, it turns into $5.71 of recurring subscription revenue. So if, if we amazing. can, yeah, if we can have Mandiant, you know, they, they can do all the IRs that they, that they want. It's fantastic. They're one of the best in the business. And they're great uh, in this industry. It, they can use our technology, leave it behind, and that, that's a win-win for customer, for Mandy, and, and for us. The Colonial Pipeline event last year, which, you know, as Americans, we already forgot a week later. Oh, that th that happened? We actually had like a third of our energy infrastructure on ice uh, for days and days. Like people don't even remember because keep in mind everything that's going on with the Kardashians and so on. But – to me, as an investor in, in CrowdStrike and just somebody that tries to be a little bit aware, um, that seemed like a big deal for your industry. Mm -hmm. Like that seemed like the kind of thing that should be uh, a point of no return for overall enterprise and government spending on cybersecurity as though it's the same as any other kind of defense spending. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that, it's, it's, that that's kick-started? Um, uh, the business the way that it should have, or is there still a delayed reaction? Well, there's a couple of big events that, you know, kind of get people focused on the right things. Um, if you look at Sunburst and what happened with SolarWinds and Microsoft and others and that, that attack, that yep. was kind of a, an eye-opening moment, very sophisticated attack focused on abusing identity as an example, which is one of the areas that we cover with, with CrowdStrike. Uh, the second one was Colonial Pipeline that was really focused on ransomware and uh, it gave everyone, I think, a pretty good view of this is not just I lose a computer. This is I lose a business if my entire infrastructure gets encrypted. We lose heating. Yeah, we lose heating, right? Is, it's, not, it's not funny. <laughs> is there an element of education now? Because obviously a lot of companies that maybe weren't so software heavy before, like the pandemic forced them to do so. So obviously the tech companies probably understand the threat. But are there other companies now that you're having to go to them and educate them and tell them, like, these are the threats that you don't even know about? We still have to do that, um, but I, I would say in today's environment, particularly for public companies, the number one risk for any board of directors is cyber. Like, go ask any board of director, what's your one or two big biggest risks? Cyber will be probably one, if not one or two. So how do you have to educate them from that standpoint? Well, I would tell you over the last year, I've done more uh, board education where they said, hey, this big attack happened, come in and talk to us. And we talk about their maturity. We talk about the risk. We talk about the adversaries focused on their organization. And then we talk about how do you move your maturity from a lower level of maturity to something higher? There's a maturity scale that we, we talk about, you know, zero through five. And that has really, I think, allowed people to move the ball forward and realize that security is not a nice to have. It's a must have. And it not only can it impact your your business but then obviously there's all the regulatory requirements that companies have to deal with so george the the securities and exchange commission has made it a regulatory priority when they come in and look at firms like ours in their uh regular examinations to really get detailed information about what we're doing to protect customer data customer assets uh mm -hmm. logins etc wealth management is extremely fragmented there are eighteen thousand registered investment advisory firms like mine. Nobody really has any market share, not asset managers, but wealth managers. And yet all of us 
and our systems are in possession of like pretty important uh, sacred customer information. Um, Salesforce does a wealth management cloud specifically for our space. Uh -huh. Have you ever looked at um, financial advisory or brokerage or wealth management as maybe the kind of thing where it would be worth customizing a product for? Or have you just not gotten there yet? What are your thoughts as it pertains to what we do for a living? Well, it's, it's probably a sales and market motion. The beauty of our technology is, and, and we have, let me just back up for a minute. If we take financial services as a broad umbrella, we have 15 sure. of the top 20 banks, right? Now, I know okay. you guys are smaller, but still financial services. And the interesting thing about our technology, this is very rare if you think about this in, in any marketplace, is the same product we sell to the DOD, we can sell to you and you know a three-man shop or three-person shop. It's, it's the same product. Like There's different bells and whistles and options, but that's it's pretty elastic of what we can do. Um, when you look at our SMB penetration, we talked about, um, you know, kind of the mid market, it's over a $300 million business. And that's bigger than many of our competitors, like entire business, but yeah. it's still less than 1% penetration in those markets. So we're in, still in the early innings and we've had a lot of success and absolutely with our trial to pay and some of our, uh, MSSP, uh, relationships, we can cover organizations like yourself. Okay, before we get to the Formula One stuff, which we'll end with, I want to ask one product-related question so that people understand what sets you apart from the Sentinels and the other publicly traded um, cybersecurity names out there. And there are probably six or seven that most investors are following. Um, your, your, I think your flagship is called Falcon. It's what most people seem to know you best for. Can you explain why that product is so powerful and why it's been so successful in the market? Yeah, I think the simple explanation is it works, you know, that, it, that's a good starting point. It, it's a starting point, right? It <laughs> works and it works really well. And there's a lot of folks that try to copy it, but it comes down to the architecture. Like, why did Siebel fail in like the online, you know, sales cloud world? Because it wasn't architected that way. Yeah. Right. And you look at Salesforce, it started from the beginning. We literally started from the beginning as a cloud platform and we're the only folks that have this single agent architecture with one data store with a modular framework that allows all of this expandability, gross margin, business model, et cetera. At the end of the day, we're solving really hard problems, which is stopping breaches. And we do that in a way that's A, scalable, and B, reduces a lot of the agent footprint that's out there. And this is something that's not really talked about. Um, on average, there's 13 agents, the pieces of software that run on your computer. Everyone will know when they start their computer, it's real slow and like lots of things run. We can reduce that dramatically, four, five, six agents. And that level of consolidation works with one agent, collect data one time, and we, we can reuse it many. So the architecture, the AI behind what we built, but more importantly, the platform that we've created allows us to exceed in security and then move into adjacencies where we took our TAM, uh, future TAM up to over the next couple of years, 126 billion. And that not only is solving a security problem, but it's solving a IT problem. And again, at the end of the day, the numbers don't lie. Less pieces of armor, less room for gaps in between those pieces of armor. So when you're yeah. able to reduce those agent, that, that agent problem. Correct. And, and what that means is it's a better user experience. There's less cost and complexity for the organization. And what we found, and we've, I've called this out in some of the earnings calls, is that a lot of our competitors and next gen included, when they get installed on something, they, they can't even get rolled out. They don't even, they don't scale, they don't work. It's, it's just kind of a disaster. And um, I recently got a truck and I have a Tesla, right? I'm a car guy. We'll talk about that in a minute. And my Tesla just works. I got in the truck and it, the screen kept freezing and rebooting and everything else. And people go, wow, why can't, you know, these folks copy Tesla? Well, you know, same reason. The thing just works. It seems simple, but it's really hard to actually replicate the user experience. Duncan, get in here. Uh, <laughs> we're, I'm out of my depth on this topic, but you are very involved in Formula One. A lot of our audience is dying to hear a little bit about that from you. Um, so why don't you, while Duncan gets his first qu question ready, Tell us why you've become associated with, with the sport and what you do. Sure. So we got involved in Formula One uh, a few years back. I've always been a, a Formula One fan. Uh, and when you think about Formula One it, and, and racing, I mean, I'm a racing fan. It sure. really uh, ties into speed and technology. 
And how we got into the Mercedes uh, organization is they became a customer. They, they mm. actually had Microsoft. It wasn't working for them. They came to us. They became a customer. They loved it. And then they, they knew I liked you know, racing and there was a passion. And we put together a very effective marketing program. One, people know us. I mean, you look at the safety car, you see CrowdStrike. But two, for the in-person events, we actually have a CXO summit. So we talk for three hours on security with thought leaders and CISOs and CIOs and CEOs. And then we take them for a very unique experience in the Formula One paddock. And that has served us really well. I can tell you we've, we've generated uh, a tremendous amount of uh, new business from those events and people know us. Yeah, for sure. Duncan, you're on. Ask okay. an insightful question about Formula One. Okay, so uh, first up, I, I just wanted to ask, you've driven a lot of different cars and a lot of different series. Do you have a favorite car? Do I have a favorite car? Uh, yeah, I would say, so I've driven a lot of different stuff. This year I drive a um, Leger P3 car, which is a prototype car in the IMSA series. And I drive a Mercedes GT3, keeping with the Mercedes brand and SRO. Um, I love both, they're, they're both different, but for pure speed and downforce and just like, it's crazy to drive one of these things, particularly like Sebring, the P3 is a pretty special car. So I have fun doing that, but both are great cars and I enjoy doing uh, both series. Yeah, those Le Mans cars look so cool, the, those prototypes. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, n another one, uh, what's your, your favorite track? Do you have a favorite track around the world? That is a good question. Um, I would say, I mean, in the U.S., it's probably Road America, um, which is a very famous track and a lot of drivers like it. I would say in Europe is Spa, which is a Formula okay. One yep. track and it's just kind of crazy Eau Rouge. You know, you probably you yep. know that yep. well. Um, and we do a 24 hour race there, uh, which has been been pretty fun. So I like that track. Uh, OK, uh, so a little uh, a little uh, longer one. So uh, how has being a race car driver um, made you a better CEO, you think? Well, that's a good one. I talk about that all the time. And, and it really is about the details. You know, you, in, a, in, a, in a race car, cars are going to be pretty similar, but it's the details that matter, how you set it up, how you prepare. Everything's about preparation, just like in our own business, right? What is, what's our goal? Is the team informed? Is everybody prepared? Do we, do we drill and practice? And then we got to execute. And if you are really into the details, which I am of racing, and you focus those, that level of like commitment and, you know, prep, 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 like we, we're not surprised on things, which is, which is why you see the results that we've come out with, because it's all planned, it's all practice, it all has a purpose. And just like in the race, you know, some days go well in the race, some days don't in the real world, some go well, some don't, but more times than not, if you focus on the details, uh, you'll get the win at the end. You just want, and you just won something. Is that right? You want, Same you want your category? Right? Uh, for in, in racing or for companies or what? In, in racing. In, race, in racing. In, in racing. Yeah. Um, I was in St. Petersburg. We were the warm up act for uh, the indie guys and, okay. and gals. And uh, so I won there. And uh, we've got a race coming up in Sonoma. So, you know, we'll, we'll just keep plugging away. George, I want to say thank you so much on behalf of all of the viewers of The Compound, the live viewers, and people who will come across this video in the weeks to come and learn a lot more about cybersecurity and CrowdStrike's role in what I think is one of the biggest secular uh, growth opportunities in the world um, over the next decade. So you guys seem to be winning all the time and want to thank you as a shareholder. And thank you so much for giving us I know how, how uh, important your time is right now. So thank you for giving us a small piece of that today. Well, thank you, uh, Josh. And thank you, Ben. And I will tell you, I really appreciate the level of detail that you go into and the, and the work you put in because you understand CrowdStrike versus everyone else uh, in terms of our competitors, I think with a, with a high level of detail. And I appreciate that. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Have a great night and good luck with everything. Thank you. All right, we're going to let George pop off. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight on the live. Really appreciate it. Make sure you like and subscribe so others may utilize the algorithm effectively to find this content and more that we're doing here on The Compound. We will be back with you all week with our regular slate of shows. Thanks to George. Thanks to Duncan, John, Nicole, and we're out. Mm -hmm.